Hello. Okay, since uh, today is the um, 31st of January 2024, and since St. Valentine's Day is not very far off, and I had started telling you uh, stories, some stories from uh, Greek mythology, and in the last video I told you about Hercules and Dionysus and so on. I thought that it would be a very good idea to tell you the story of Cupid and Psyche. Cupid was, in the Greek, was uh, the uh, Eros, the god of love, and Psyche means the soul uh, in Greek. Now, I'm going to tell you the story, the, the mythological tale of, uh, of these two lovers, okay? But just to, um, as, as a preamble, just let me tell you, classical philosophers and classical writers, and in all their mythology tales, tell us that love and since we have so many wars and so much anxiety, I thought, you know, it would be a good idea to talk about love. Love, they said, they say in, in, in rather romantic terms, has the power to hurt and wound our souls. And so they portray, they portrayed love as a naked child, Cupid, blind with wings, loaded with arrows and this is to depict the passion and devotion of love so why do they depict l uh, love as a child because they want to say that those in love mirror let us say as much discretion or prudence as a child none but at the same time, it is transparent and innocent as a child, pure love, yeah? Why does it have wings? Because they say it is with great fleetness that lovers make themselves visible to their beloved. Love is never uh, tardy to get going. Why blind? because although it has a mind of its own to begin with it does not depend on reason and why does this naked child um, carries uh, uh, bow and arrows ah you see because it shoots from afar and raising passion and it shoots from afar straight into the heart, they say, because like that of an arrow, love's piercing is clean and direct. We're talking about pure love, yeah. <laughs> but the pain it produces is deep and intense. And because though this piercing might hardly be noticeable, to begin with, the wound that it leaves behind, it may leave behind, takes a long time to heal, much longer to cure. Remember that song, that French song, Plaisir d'amour, okay? The refrain is always the joy of love. It's brief, might be brief, but the wound that leaves behind may last a lifetime. Okay, so through uh, or by means of these tales in mythology, they are teaching us about love. So I'm going to read you the story. It's a cute story, lovely story, about it's a story of love and adventure. And this story is told only by Apuleius, uh, a Latin writer of the second century. AD. Uh, it is uh, much older than that. It's a prettily, uh, prettily told, uh, told tale. After it, he, he says it in the manner of Ovid, really. 
The writer is entertained by what he writes, but he doesn't believe a word of it even even then. So let me tell you the story about Cupid and Psyche. There was once a king who had three daughters, all lovely maidens, but the youngest, Psyche, excelled her sister so greatly that beside them she seemed a very goddess consorting with mere mortals. The fame of her surpassing beauty spread over the earth, and everywhere men journeyed to gaze upon her with wonder and adoration, and to do her homage as though she were in truth one of the immortals. They would even say that Venus herself, in Greek Aphrodite, they would even say that Venus herself could not equal this mortal. As they throng in ever-growing numbers to worship her loveliness, no one any more gave a thought to Venus herself. Her temples were neglected now, her altars foul and cold, uh, with cold ashes, her favorite towns deserted and falling in ruins. All the honors once hers were now given to a mere girl destined some day to die. It may well be believed that the goddess would not put up with this treatment. As always, when she was in trouble, she turned for help to her son, that beautiful winged youth whom some call Cupid and others call Love against whose arrows there is no defense, neither in heaven nor in earth, nor on earth. She told him her wrongs, and as always he was ready to do her bidding. Use your power, she said, and make the hussy fall madly in love with the vilest and most despicable creature there uh, that there is in this world. And so, no doubt, he would have done if Venus had not first shown him Psyche, the girl, never thinking in her jealous rage what such beauty might do even to the god of love himself. And as he looked upon her, it was as if he had shot one of his own arrows into his own heart. He said nothing to his mother, Indeed, he had no power to utter a word, and Venus left him with the happy confidence that he would swiftly bring about Psyche's ruin. What happened, however, was not what she had counted on. Psyche did not fall in love with the horrible wretch. She did not fall in love at all. Still more strange, no one fell in love with her. Men were content to look and wonder and worship and then pass on to marry someone else. Both her sisters, inexpressibly inferior to her, were splendidly, splendidly married, each to a king. Psyche, the all-beautiful, sat sad and solitary, only admired, never loved. It seemed that no man wanted her. This was, of course, most disturbing to her parents. Her father finally traveled to the oracle of Apollo in Delphi to ask his advice on how to get her a good husband. The god answered him, but his words were terrible. Cupid had told him the whole story and had begged for his help. Accordingly, Apollo said that Psyche dressed in deep mourning, in the deepest mourning, must be set on the summit of a rocky hill and left alone, and that there her destined husband, a fearful winged serpent, stronger than the gods themselves, would come to her and make her his wife. The misery of all when Psyche's father brought back these lamentable news can be imagined. They dressed the maiden as though for her death. 
and carried her to the hill with greater sorrowing than if he had been to her tomb. But Psyche herself kept her courage. You should have wept for me before, she told them, because of the beauty that has drawn down upon me the jealousy of heaven because of my beauty. Now, knowing that I am glad the end has now I'm glad that the end has come. So they went in despairing grief, leaving the lovely helpless creature to meet her doom alone, and they shut themselves in their palace to mourn all their days for her. On the hilltop, in the darkness, Psyche sat, waiting for she knew not what terror. There, as she wept and trembled, a soft breath of air came through the stillness to her, the gentle breathing of sapphire the wind, sweetest, the mildest of winds. She f felt she felt it lift, lifted her up. She was floating away from the rocky hill and down until she lay upon a grassy meadow, so soft as a bed and fragrant with flowers. It was so peaceful there, all her trouble left her, and she slept. She woke beside a bright river, and on its bank was a mansion, stately and beautiful, as though built for a god, with pillars of gold and walls of silver and floors inlaid with precious stones. No sound was to be heard. The place seemed deserted, and Psyche drew near, awestruck at the sight of such splendor. As she hesi hesitated on the threshold, voices sounded in her ear. She could see no one, but the words they spoke came clearly to her. The house was for her, they told her. She must enter without fear and bathe and refresh herself. Then a banquet table would be spread for her. We are your servants, the voices said, ready to do whatever you desire. The bath was the most delightful, the food the most delicious she had ever enjoyed. While she dined, sweet music breathed around her. A great choir seemed to sing to a harp but she could only hear, not see them. Throughout the day, except for the strange companionship of the voices, she was alone, but in some inexplicable way she felt sure that with the coming of the night her husband would be with her. And so it happened. When she felt him beside her and heard his voice softly murmuring in her ear, all her fears left her. She knew without seeing him that he was no monster or shape of terror, but the lover and husband that she had longed and waited for. This half and half companionship could not fully content her. Still, she was happy and the time passed swiftly. One night, however, had her dear though unseen husband spoke gravely to her and warned her that danger in the shape of her two sisters was approaching. They are coming to the hill where you disappeared to weep for you, he said, but you must not let them see you or you will bring great sorrow upon me and ruin to myself. She promised him she would not, but all the next days she passed in weeping, thinking of her sisters and herself, unable to comfort them. She was still in tears when her husband came, and even his caresses could not check them. At last he yielded sorrowfully to her great desire. Do what you will, he said, but you are seeking your own destruction. Then he warned her solemnly not to be persuaded by anyone to try to see him, 
on pain of being separated from him forever. Psyche cried out that she would never do so. She would die a hundred times sober rather than live without him. But give me this joy, she said, to see my sisters. Sadly, he promised her that it should be so. The next morning, the two came, brought down from the mountain by the wind so far. Happy and excited, Psyche was waiting for them. It was long before the three could speak to each other. Their joy was too great to be expressed except by tears and embraces. But when at last they entered the palace and the elder sisters saw it surpassing treasures, when they sat at the rich banquet and heard the marvelous music, bitter envy took possession of them and a devouring curiosity as to who was the lord of all this magnificence and their sisters and their sister's husband but psyche kept faith she told them only that he was a young man away now on a hunting expedition and then filling their hands with gold and jewels she had the wind bear them back to the hill. They went willingly enough, but their hearts were on fire with jealousy. All their own wealth and good fortune seemed to them as nothing compared with Psyche's, and their envious anger so worked in them that they came finally to plotting how to ruin her. That very night, Psyche's husband warned her once more. She would not listen when he begged her not to let them come again. She never could see him, she reminded him. Was she also to be forbidden to see all others, even her sisters, so dear to her? He yielded as before, and very soon the two wicked women arrived with their plot carefully worked out. Already, because of Psyche's stumbling and contradictory answers when they asked her what her husband looked like, they had become convinced that she had never set eyes on him and did not really know what he was. They did not tell her this, but they reproached her for hiding her terrible state from them, her own sisters. They had learned, they said, and knew for a fact that her husband was not a man, but the fearful serpent Apollo's oracle had declared he would be. He was kind now, no doubt, but he would certainly turn upon her some night and devour her. Psyche, aghast, felt terror flooding her heart instead of love. She had wondered so often why he would never let her see him. There must be some dreadful reason. What did she really know about him? If he was not horrible to look at, then he was cruel to forbid her ever to behold him. In extreme misery, faltering and stammering, she gave her sisters to understand that she could not deny what they said because she had been with him only in the dark. There must be something very wrong, she sobbed, for him so to shun the light of day, and she begged them to advise her. They had their advice all prepared beforehand. That night she must hide a sharp knife and a lamp near the bed. When her husband was fast asleep, she must leave the bed, light the lamp and get the knife. She must steel herself to plunge it swiftly into the body of the frightful being the light would certainly show her. We will be near, they said and carry you away with us when he's dead. Then they left her torn by doubt and distracted what to do. She loved him. 
she was her, he was her dear husband. No, he was a horrible serpent and she loaded him. She would kill him. No, she would not. Perhaps she would. No, she wouldn't. She must have certainty. She did not want certainty. So all day her thoughts fought with each other and when evening came, however, she had given the struggle up. One thing she was determined to do, she would see him. When at last he lay sleeping quietly, she summoned all her courage and lit the lamp. She tiptoed to the bed and holding the light half high above her, she gazed at what lay there. Oh, the relief and the rapture that filled her heart. No monster was revealed, but the sweetest and fairest of all creatures, at whose sight the very lamp seemed to shine brighter. In her first shame at her folly and lack of faith, Psyche fell on her knees and would have plunged the knife into her own breast if he had not fallen from her trembling hands. But those same unsteady hands that saved her betrayed her too, for as she hung over him, ravished at the sight of him, and unable to deny herself the bliss of filling her eyes with his beauty, some hot oil fell from the lamp upon his old shoulder and he started awake. He saw the light and knew her faithlessness, and without a word he fled from her. She rushed out after him into the night. She could not see him, but she heard his voice speaking to her. He told her who he was and sadly bade her farewell. He said, love cannot live where there is no trust and he flew away. The God of love, she thought. He was my husband, and I, wretched that I am, could not keep faith with him. Is he gone from me forever? At any rate, she told herself with rising courage, I can spend the rest of my life searching for him. If he has no more love left for me, at least I can show him how much I love him and she started on her journey. She had no idea where to go. She knew only that she would never give up looking for him. He, meanwhile, had gone to his mother's chamber to have his wound ca cared for. But when Venus heard his story and learned that it was Psyche whom he had chosen, she left him angrily alone in his pain and went forth to find the girl of whom he had made her still more jealous. Venus was determined to show Psyche what it meant to draw down the displeasure of a goddess. Poor Psyche, in her despairing wanderings, was trying to win the gods over to her side. She offered ardent prayers to them perpetually, but not one of them would do anything to make Venus their enemy. At last she perceived that there was no hope for her, either in heaven or on earth, and she took a desperate resolve. She would go straight to Venus. She would offer herself humbly to her as her servant and try to soften her anger. And who knows, she thought, if he himself is not there in his mother's house, perhaps. So she set forth to find the goddess who was looking everywhere for her herself. When she came into Venus's presence, the goddess laughed aloud and asked her scornfully if she was seeking a husband since, since the one that she had had would have nothing to do with her because he had almost died of the burning wound she had given him. But really, she said, 
You are so plain and ill-favored a girl that you will never be able to get you a lover except by the most diligent and painful service. I will therefore show my good will to you by training you in such ways. And with that she took a great quantity of the smallest of the seeds, wheat and poppy and millet and so on, and mixed them all together in a big heap. By night these must all be sorted, she said. See to it for your own sake. And with that she departed. Psyche, left alone, sat still and stared at the heap. Her mind was all in a maze because of the cruelty of the command, and indeed it was of no use to start a task so manifestly impossible. But at this direful moment, she who had awakened no compassion in mortals or immortals was pitied by the tiniest creatures of the field, the little ants, the swift runners. They cried to each other, Come, have mercy on this poor maid and help her diligently. At once they came, waves of them, one after another, and they laboured, separating and dividing, until what had been a confused mass lay all ordered, every seed with its kind. This was what Venus found when she came back, and very angry, she was to see it. Your work is by no means over, she said, and then she gave Psyche a crust of bread and bade her sleep on the ground while she herself went off to her soft, fragrant couch. Surely, if she could keep the girl at hard labor and half starve her too, that hateful beauty of hers would soon be lost. Until then, she must see that her son was securely guarded in his chamber, where he was still suffering from his wound. Venus was pleased at the way matters were shaping. The next morning, she devised another task for Psyche, this time a dangerous one. Down there, near the river bank, she said, where the bushes grow thick, are sheep with fleeces of gold. Go fetch me some of their shining wool. When the worn girl reached the gently flowing stream, a great longing seized her to throw herself into it and end all her pain and despair. But as she was bending over the water, she heard a little voice from near her feet, and looking down saw that it came from a green reed. She must not drown herself, it said. Things were not as bad as that. The sheep were indeed very fierce, but if Psyche would wait until they came out of the bushes towards, toward evening to rest beside the river, she could go into the thicket and find plenty of the golden wool hanging on the sharp briars. So spoke the kind and gentle reed, and Psyche, following the directions, was able to carry back to her cruel mistress a quantity of the shining fleece. Venus received it with an evil smile. Someone help you, she said sharply. Never did you do this by yourself. However, I will give you an opportunity to prove that you really have the stout heart and the singular prudence you make such a show of. Do you see that black water which falls from the hill yonder? It is the source of the terrible river which is called Hateful, the river Styx. You are to fill this flask from it. That was the worst task yet, and Psyche saw when she approached the waterfall that it was the worst task. Only a winged creature, winged creature 
could reach it, really, so steep and slimy were the rocks on all sides, and so fearful the onrush of the descending waters. But by this time, it must be evident to all the readers of this story, as perhaps deep in her heart it had become evident to Psyche herself, that although each of her trials seemed impossible, impossibly hard, an excellent way out would always be provided for her. This time, her saviour was an eagle who poised on his great wings beside her, seized the flask from her, uh, from her with his beak and brought it back to her full of the black water. But Venus kept on. One cannot but excuse her of some stupidity. The only effect of all that, all that had happened was to make her try again and she gave Psyche a box which she was to carry to the underworld and ask Proserpine to fill it with some of her beauty. She was to tell her that Venus really needed it. She was so worn out from nursing her sick son. Obediently, as always, Psyche went forth to look for the road to Hades. She found her guide in a tower she passed. It gave her careful directions how to get to Proserpine's palace, first through a great hole in the earth, then down to the river of death, where she must give the ferryman, Charon, a penny to take her across. From there the road led straight to the palace. Cerverus, the three-headed dog, guarded the doors. But if she gave him a cake, he would be friendly and let her pass. All happened, of course, as the tower had foretold. Proserpine was willing to do Venus a service, and Psyche, greatly encouraged, bore back the box, returning far more quickly than she had, uh, than she had gone down. Her next trial she brought upon herself through her curiosity and still more her vanity. She felt that she must see what that beauty charm in the box was and perhaps use a little of it herself. She knew quite well, quite as well as Venus did, that her looks were not improved improved by what she had gone through, and always in her mind was the thought that she might suddenly meet Cupid. If only she could make herself more lovely for him. She was unable to resist the temptation. She opened the box. To her sharp disappointment, she saw nothing there. It seemed empty. Immediately, however, a deadly languor, languor took possession of her and she fell into a heavy sleep. At this juncture, the god of love himself stepped forward. Cupid was healed of his wound by now and longing for Psyche. It is a difficult matter to keep love imprisoned. Venus had locked the door, but there were the windows. All Cupid had to do was to fly out and start looking for his wife. She was lying almost beside the palace, and he found her at once. In a moment he had wiped the slip from her eyes and put it back into the box. Then, waking her with just a prick from one of his arrows and scolding her a little for her curiosity, he bade her take Proserpine's box to his mother and he assured her that all thereafter would be well. While the joyful Psyche hastened on her errand, the god flew up to Olympus. He wanted to make certain that Venus would give them no more trouble, so he went straight to Jupiter himself. Zeus, the father of gods and men, consented at once to all that Cupid asked. Even though, he said, you have done me great harm in the past, 
seriously injured my good name and my dignity by making me change myself into a bull and a swan and so on. However, I cannot refuse you. Then he called a full assembly of the gods and announced to all, including Venus, that Cupid and Psyche were formally married and that he proposed to bestow immortality upon the bride. Mercury brought Psyche into the palace of the gods, and Jupiter himself gave her the ambrosia to taste, which made her immortal. This, of course, completely changed the situation. Venus could not object to a goddess for her daughter-in-law. The alliance had become eminently suitable. No doubt she reflected also that Psyche, living up in heaven with her husband and children to care for, could not be much on the earth to turn man's heads and interfere with her own worship. So all came to a most happy end. Love and the soul, for that is what Psyche means, had sought and after sore trials found each other, and that union could never be broken. Let me show you the lovely... Um, this is Psyche gazed at the sleeping Cupid. See? This is Cupid here. Okay. Wow! Okay, that's Cupid sleeping and Psyche there. Okay, so this is my story for today. Love and the soul and all that sort of thing, so think about it. And tell me in the comments what you think of it. What do you think it all means? Bye-bye.